Yes, the relay on YouTube. Check it out. Lots of uh, stories about me on there. All the boxing facts and info that you want in a very entertaining, educational manner. The relay. Check it out on YouTube. Welcome to the motherfucking relay. Where we're covering today's top boxing news. Ow! Okay, we'll start with this. Per a tweet from Michael Benson, Eddie Hearn has now made an offer to Natasha Jonas to rematch Terry Harper in an undisputed WBA, WBC, IBF, and WBO Super Welterweight World Title fight next. Harper's trainer, manager, Steffi Bull, has confirmed. I don't think for a second Natasha Jonas wants to migrate from Boxer and Sky back over to Matchroom and DAZN. They've worked hard over there at Boxer and Sky, gotten Natasha the right fights and the right opportunities to put her in a position of power where she's not just an opponent, she has options, many options, and I don't think for a second, not even for Undisputed, I don't think for a second Natasha wants to go back over to Matchroom and DAZN. I said it beforehand, the only way I can see this fight happening is if Terry Harper migrates over to Boxer and Sky Sports for the fight. And that's if Natasha Jonas is even receptive to such a match. We'll get into that. Steffi Bull himself stated, I can confirm that a large high-end six-figure offer has been sent to Team Jonas for Harper vs. Jonas 2 from Matchroom. One of the best female fights to have taken place, hashtag undisputed, on the line. It's got history, it's got everything, and I do agree with Steffi. Aesthetically, it's one of the best fights I've ever seen. The fight took place two years ago at Fight camp took a lot of people by surprise. A lot of people thought Natasha Jonas was a little more than cannon fodder for young Terry Harpier, but she gave Terry a run for her money, and there is a demand for a second fight, for a rematch. There's a demand amongst the fans. Natasha Jonas herself, however, she's not demanding the fight. Quite the opposite. She says, Mr. Big Six Figures, oxymoron, stop the cap. I've been getting six figures since I left, but We'll see. A Twitter user that goes by the name Rob G stated, hopefully better, fairer judges this time, to which Natasha Jonas responded, and throw in Vada testing. You know, I said it in my previous video and I'll say it here again. I think there are a lot of hard feelings there. I think there's bad blood between the teams and not just bad blood between the teams, but bad blood between Natasha Jonas and Matchroom. I think there is. Natasha's asking for Vada testing. Terry Harper herself, the newly crowned WBA junior middleweight champion, she stated, if you're struggling at this weight, I can recommend you a good strength and conditioning coach. I said it in my previous video. It might not seem that way on the surface to the naked eye, but upon close observation, there seem to be a lot of hard feelings between the teams. It's funny how things happen in this old game, the sport of boxing. You know, for a long time, the conversation was Terry Harper versus Michaela Mayer, and that rivalry, that transatlantic. For a long time, that was the conversation, but time has proven that Terry Harper's rival isn't Michaela Mayer. Terry Harper's real rival, her real adversary, is Natasha Jonas, and the same is true in reverse. For a long time, we thought that Terry's rival was Michaela Mayer, and the same was true in reverse. Time has proven that Michaela's rival is actually Alicia Baumgartner, and Terry Harper's rival is Natasha Jonas. Those are the real rivalries. A Twitter user that goes by the name Wayne Love stated, Bit of a smart-ass answer considering Matchroom Boxing brought you back in from the unknown, to which Natasha Jonas responded to be beaten in a lockdown where no other fights were available for their boxer. Natasha Jonas doesn't seem to have any illusions about her tenure at Matchroom and what they wanted for her. She's of the opinion they just used her as an opponent. It was the only opportunity for a fight available at the time. Katie was fighting Serrano, Chantel Cameron was in that tournament, McCaskill was fighting, and I can't make super featherweight anymore. Detailing her decision to move all the way upstairs to junior middleweight. When young Natasha Jonas crossed over from Matchroom and DAZN over to Sky Sports and Boxer, I said it then, she made the right decision the right decision for herself. Matchroom was not utilizing this fighter as a centerpiece per se. They were utilizing young Natasha as an opponent for other fighters that they were perhaps more invested in. And she made the right decision for herself. And in the end, it paid off the gamble. 
it worked out. That doesn't necessarily mean that Matt Truma are the bad guys here. That doesn't mean that Natasha Jonas and Smoke and Joe Gallagher are the bad guys either. There are no bad guys in this situation. It's just that everybody can't get what they want when they want it. Sometimes that happens, though. Ultimately, Natasha and Joe, they made the right decision. It worked out for them, though, unfortunately. We may not get that junior middleweight undisputed title fight, as Natasha Jonas, in her own words, says... I'm not chasing Terry. If you wanted a finite and conclusive answer, an insight as to where Tasha stands on a potential undisputed junior middleweight title fight with the only other champion at this weight, Terry Harper, if you wanted to know... There's your answer. You know, I told you guys, I don't think either Natasha Jonas or Terry Harper are going to spend much time up there at 154 pounds because Mary Spencer is coming and she is a credible, near and apparent threat to the both of them. Thus, I expected that, you know, if they're going to do this fight between them, this undisputed title fight, they've got to get a move on. And it seems that those... Those talks never got off the ground. Doesn't look like they're about to. The WBO has issued a show cause letter to Jessica McCaskill that may see the WBO title vacated. And if it's vacated, you know, Natasha Jonas can shoot for that and she can shoot for a Jessica McCaskill fight straight away. She does have options. So if you were holding out hope to see the rematch at junior middleweight for all the marbles, unfortunately, it doesn't look like that conversation has any traction. It doesn't look like that's what's going to be It doesn't look like that's going to happen. Men's lightweight news, Javante Davis's next fight seemed to be in the works, and you don't get the sense that it's going to be the long-awaited, long-anticipated Ryan Garcia fight based on Javante Davis's hints, which he's been dropping by way of his social media, stating January D.C., as in Washington D.C. You know, that's more or less Javante Davis's neck of the woods. Hop, skip, and a jump away from Baltimore, Maryland. Where Javante Davis is from, and if you're doing a fight over there, it's basically a hometown fight for Javante Davis. Not a mega fight like a Ryan Garcia fight would be. The ideal location for a fight like that would have to be a, a Las Vegas. I mean, it wouldn't be in D.C., I'll tell you that much. So who could Javante Davis be fighting in D.C.? Could it be a, a Abner Mares? You know, there's been widespread rumors and speculations that the recent resurgence of Abner Mares, rather, what's left of him, that that might be geared towards fattening him up for an eventual Javante Davis fight. We know that they were supposed to fight each other some years ago, but Abner Mares suffered an eye injury that kept him out of action for some years. He very recently returned to action, and that's given rise to widespread speculation that he'll be fighting Javante Davis sometime in the near future. Otherwise, why would he have come back? Yeah, there's an argument there. I'll tell you, Abner Mares didn't look too hot in his last fight. He was all right for the first two or three rounds, but he kind of faded down the stretch. Obvious effect of ring rust having not fought in some years. What was it, like two, maybe three? Let's be honest. There was no demand for Abner Mares to return to action, and there is no demand for Abner Mares to take on Javante Davis, of all people. There is a demand to see Javante in certain kind of fights with certain kinds of fighters, but... It's become common knowledge that those demands are met with deaf ears. It's become common knowledge that... The fighters that you would like to see in the ring with Javante Davis are the least likely. Your Shakur Stevenson, your Devin Haney, your Teofimo Lopez. You know, these kinds of guys, these kinds of fighters. These are the guys that are least likely to share the ring with Javante Davis, per Floyd Mayweather Jr.'s own words. In a nutshell, what he said is that Shakur Stevenson and Devin Haney, they should just leave Javante Davis alone and let him do his own thing. And that's what he's going to keep doing, though. Who he ends up fighting in January in D.C., you don't do a Ryan Garcia fight in D.C. Let's get that right out of the way. It's a less than ideal location for a fight that size. You really can't optimize its value as a fight doing it in D.C. So I don't think it's going to be Ryan. Perhaps it'll be former WBC featherweight champion Gary Russell Jr. He lost his WBC title to Mark McSayo earlier this year. He hasn't rebounded off the loss. Not yet. He's wanted a Javante Davis fight for some time, and he just might get it. He might. It wouldn't be the first time that Javante Davis fought a fighter that's coming off a loss and jumping up two weight classes for a fight with him. That was more or less the situation with Jesus Cuellar. He dropped a split decision to Abner Mahrez down there at featherweight in 2016, set out for two years, and returned to action at super featherweight in 2018 against Javante Davis, coming right off of that loss. That was a WBA title fight. Would be a similar situation if it's Gary Russell 
that Javante Davis ends up fighting, except Gary would be jumping up two weight classes as opposed to just one, like Jesus did. Though all the same, he is coming off a decision loss, the same as Jesus Cuellar was some years ago, ahead of a Javante Davis fight. Could it be Gary Russell Jr. that Javante Davis ends up fighting? They're both from around that area, so it might pull in a hometown crowd. It might, though it is somewhat frivolous to stage a fight like that with a fighter coming right off a loss. It is somewhat frivolous to stage a fight like that as a pay-per-view, but as we all know, the people over there at the TMT and the PBC are no strangers to mediocrity. They're no strangers to staging frivolous pay-per-views, frivolous box office fights. They do it all the time. This would just be another. I think Gary Russell Jr., Davis versus Russell Jr., is a distinct possibility. Yet another possibility is a fight between Gervonta Davis and 140-pound champion, newly crowned... Alberto Puello of the Dominican Republic. He's a PBC fighter. He's an unbeaten guy. He's a champion. He's got a belt. And he's got next to no profile. So he is an inexpensive option for Gervonta Davis. That's right. DC in that part of town against Javante Davis, even though Javante is not the reigning champion, he'd be the A-side fighter to Alberto Puello, and for Alberto, he might get a career-high purse, a career-high payday fighting Javante. Nothing exorbitant, nothing extravagant, just more than what he normally makes. That would require Javante Davis to return to the 140-pound division, but he's running out of options at 135. I mean, the most they really can do for him at 135 pounds is stage rematches with Isaac Cruz or Roly Romero revisit those fights. And those are distinct possibilities, too. Those fights can happen. The PBC ain't strangers to stage in pointless rematches. Wilder versus Ortiz, too. Leo Santa Cruz versus Abnamaras, too. Stevenson versus Fanfara, too. Javante Davis has options, you know, between 135 and 140. It's just that none of those options are high profile options. High profile fights like the Ryan Garcia fight would have been. And whatever fight they're about to put on is a substitute for a Ryan Garcia fight because that's what people were expecting. You know, since they've both been hinting at it for the last few weeks, the last few months, they built up that expectation between each other. You fight somebody else. Listen, it's not just on Javante, it's on Ryan Garcia too. The same applies to him. You fight somebody else, it's a substitute. It's an alternative. That's all it is. The difference being, however, that Ryan Garcia's next fight isn't a pay-per-view, whereas Javante's... You know, they're gonna try to bill it as a box office fight. You know it's gonna have a $75, $80 price tag. One fight's a pay-per-view and one fight isn't. Even if Ryan does end up fighting somebody else, it's not gonna cost you any extra money. So you know. We'll see who it is Javante Davis ends up fighting, because it doesn't look like it's gonna be Ryan. My philosophy is never stop getting it. Currency over legacy. Currency over legacy. So... This soundbite from Floyd Mayweather is getting a lot of attention. Currency over legacy. If Floyd Mayweather were truly of that mindset, he wouldn't have made as much currency as he made throughout the course of his career because whether Floyd Mayweather is aware of it or not, he's the kind of fighter that you have to categorize as a legacy fighter. A multi-weight champion who fought many other champions and beat them, stayed sharp, honing his craft, perfecting it. Wasn't it Floyd Mayweather that got into a heated argument with Bryant Kenny over his pound-for-pound -pound status and his career? His legacy, in a nutshell. Oh, Floyd's perspective may have changed over time as far as what it takes to make the most money in the sport of boxing. But make no mistake, without legacy, there ain't that much currency. So you go telling these young fighters currency over legacy and they don't prioritize their legacy they won't get at that much currency treat your career like it's a going out of business sale and you'll go out of business because you are essentially the business you know i have no doubts that over there at the pbc that's likely what they tell a lot of those young fighters those fighters that they groomed over time quote unquote groomed so to speak and that's why not a single one of those fighters has gone on to have the same success as a Floyd Mayweather or even a Canelo Alvarez for that matter. None of those fighters they've got over there went on to become the same kind of draw that Canelo is. And what's Canelo? What was Oscar De La Hoya? What was Manny Pacquiao? There are common denominators between these fighters, you know. These kind of fighters, fighters like Sugar Ray Leonard, George Foreman, they all have great legacies as fighters. That is what they have in common. All of them. A few nuances and subtleties aside, these are the ties that bind. Every single one of these fighters, Floyd Mayweather Jr. included, fought in the big fights. 
the big, big fight. Not just the title fights. Not just the unification matches. The big fights. The mega fights. Every single one of these aforementioned fighters and a few that I didn't mention. They got great legacies and they made a lot of fucking money. Floyd made a lot of money. From the Oscar De La Hoya fight, he was already a very accomplished fighter by the time that he fought Oscar De La Hoya, had already fought several champions. He had already fought several champions by the time he fought Canelo Alvarez, ranked as the number one pound-for-pound fighter at that time. That's who Floyd Mayweather Jr. was when he fought Canelo and when he fought Manny. What was that? Was that a cash grab or was that a legacy fight? Between the then consensus number one and number two pound-for-pound fighters in the sport. To make the big bucks, you have to get people's attention. You have to fight in big fights. Big fights that people want to see. Fights that there's an actual grassroots demand for. You have to fight in the big fights to make the big bucks. Moreover, you have to be ready to win those big fights. Because if you falter on the biggest stage that you've ever fought on for the first time... It's not just getting at the big fights. You have to be ready to win them. Floyd Mayweather's perverse perspectives on pugilism here today don't mirror the kind of career that he had as a fighter. Even if time has altered his perspectives on what a fighter should do, the reality of it is, if you prioritize currency over legacy, you won't get at that much currency. Because it's the legacy that gets you the most currency. The legacy fights. They go hand in hand. Those legacy fights. There's often a lot at stake. High stakes situations. High stakes fights. High tension, big lights, hot ones. There's always an element of danger in the squared circle, but that element of danger is elevated in the big fights, the risky ones, but those risky fights... Where you may be opposite the ring someone who's as good as or better than you are. Look at Katie Taylor. She's the top earning woman boxer in the sport of women's boxing, and what is she always going on about? Legacy. In his heyday, Sugar Ray Leonard was the top earning pugilist, the top earning boxer of his era, and he's got some hell of a legacy. So does Oscar De La Hoya. Oscar De La Hoya, who helped catapult Floyd Mayweather Jr.'s career in their legacy fight. Floyd went on to have other big fights, other big matches that he wasn't just ready to have, he was ready to win. But if you tell these young fighters this perverse version, they're never going to come close to making the same kind of money that you made or the same kind of money that Canelo is making with a mindset like. Like that. You're essentially telling these guys to take shortcuts, but you don't make it to the big bucks. You don't. Taking shortcuts. It's bad advice. It makes for bad habits in and outside the ring. Bad practices that'll lead you down a bad path, spiraling downward. It's legacy and legacy fighters that are the top earners in the sport of boxing. It's a common denominator between several eras of top earning boxers. The biggest fights draw the biggest crowds, which generate the biggest revenue, results in the biggest purses. And these oftentimes are legacy fights. Even if you yourself don't give two furry fucks about legacy, those are the fights that are going to get you paid because those are the fights that get attention. It's likely what they're telling Javante Davis. Currency over legacy effectively placing a cap a ceiling on how far and how high he can go. You won't make Mayweather money, Canelo money, De La Hoya money, thinking like that. You won't. Coincidentally, nobody on that side of the street has gone on to become a mega star. Not a single one of those guys is the same kind of draw that Canelo Alvarez is. But that Mayweather was 